No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother f What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over! No comment! The f Brian Keane was also unavailable for comment. Welcome back once again to The Horror Show with Brian Keene, brought to you by the Project Entertainment Network and available for free, always for free, on Stitcher, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and all other platforms. I am, of course, your host, Brian Keene. With me, as always, Mr. Matt Wilderson. Hello. Mary San Giovanni. Hi there. And Kelly Owen. Yo. Coming up. <laughs> yo. <laughs> <laughs> You I know. do want to remind folks, this week's episode is pre-recorded. We're actually recording this on March 2nd. You're not going to hear it for like two weeks. Uh, there may be news happening in the genre right now, and you may be wondering why we're not covering it. Uh, that's why, because we're recording this back. We don't know about it. Yeah, yet. we're recording <laughs> this back in March yet, And 2nd. we're not that good. <laughs> I mean, we're getting there, but we're not that good yet. We could guess. I mean, if you really need us to guess. I just, somebody's going to have a fit and start a fight. That'll be Twitter. Um, somebody's <laughs> going to whine and vague book. That'll be Facebook. And somebody somewhere touched something or someone they shouldn't have. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Plus politics. Oh, and a movie will come out that everybody fucking hates, so they got to all tell you about that. There, we're caught up now. We caught up now? Yeah. All right. Uh, no, obviously, if if something monumental did happen, we will be back to cover it next week. We just don't know about it here on March 2nd. What we do know is that coming up in just a few moments, uh, we're going to have a panel of first-time novelists. We're going to have J. Edwin Buja, Mary Hart, Michelle Renee Lane, Sherry Sebastian Gabriel, and Tony Tremblay. They joined me last October at the Merrimack Valley Halloween Book Festival to talk about writing their first novel. And we recorded that. And uh, unlike a lot of the things that I try to record at these conventions, this one actually worked. We've got the whole <laughs> panel. Um, Matt's cleaned it up, made it sound good. So we're going we're gonna to get to that. But before we do, I thought each of us would talk about our first. Um, now, I've talked at length on this show. I did a whole episode about the rising. Uh, I, I think it's like episode three or four, you know, six years ago, it, it's called the secret origin of the rising. If you go back to the archives, you can find it. Um, you know, I can talk about it again, certainly, but I'd like to hear more from the three of you. Cause I don't think that you know, Kelly, maybe you have as a guest on the show, Mary, actually, I guess all three of you were guests before you ever joined staff. So all three of you have talked about your first novel, or your first collection on the show at one point, but talk about it again, because obviously we have new listeners. And nobody's going to scroll back. To the yeah. Game. Nobody's going to go back through the fucking archives, <laughs> but who wants to go first? I think Matt should. You think Matt should? Okay. Matt, do you think you should? Uh, if you listen to last week's show, Matt addressed some issues, and I'm trying to be You're going to carry that shit over. I'm trying to be more cognizant and more inclusive and, and treat Matt with respect. I chose Matt because I know Mary's and, origin and story, and I wanted to hear yours. Okay. All right. Matt, uh, if you would like to. Oh, you know. <laughs> so this is how you're going to go about this. He's going to coddle you. He's going to helicopter parent you right to death. <laughs> Christ. I quit everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, did you write a book? Let's start there. Yeah, I did. I tell, wrote one. Did you, did you, what, what's uh, the genre that you work in? It, 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 let Matt tell his what story. What 
Don't presume, Kelly. Let Matt tell his story. Well, I wasn't presuming. I was asking. It's kind of the opposite of presuming. She is correct. <laughs> yeah. no. Tell um, us, you wanted to talk about your first collection. Yeah, uh, the first collection that was uh, Edge of Twilight I put together. Um, I had always wanted to write for a very long time. When I was probably around five or six, I remember my parents had uh, a typewriter that we had from, I guess it was my great-great-grandfather, um, I believe. Uh, don't quote me on that. It, I've had so many grandfathers, I don't really know where they all are. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I remember we, we got this typewriter the one day, and I just, I was like, I'm going to write like Stephen King, because, you know, Aww. that's what a lot of people back then yes, read. And like, that's true. For me, I started off reading like Goosebumps, mm-hmm. and then it went to like Scary Stories, and right. th- then it went, then I started reading King and I went to an all Catholic school. So I was the weirdo. Yeah. Fist bump Me on that. Too. Uh, I was yeah, the, but you're actually Catholic. Like, yeah. Yeah. You're I, not, I, I right? was not anymore. No. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't there. I wasn't when they sent me there. No, I, I asked it's questions and I was problems. the free thinker. So I was yeah. the dangerous person, but, um, yeah, I, I, I would bring King books in and, People are looking at me like, you know, oh, it, he's reading that kind of stuff. Oh, and, he's one you know. of them. So I always wanted to write. And I had that typewriter. I think I wrote – it was like four pages. And God knows what the hell it even was about anymore. I can't remember. But then it was just kind of like I didn't really have a lot of support in a sense. Because, mm-hmm. like, my dad was just always like, oh, you come up with these weird ideas. And, you know, oh, you know, you, you should find a job that, you know, is going to make you money. Because this is just dreams. And. It was like, okay, fine. So I, I didn't think about that stuff for a while. And then I guess it was just recently I was writing some stories and like I had my wife read them and she was like, these are really interesting. I think you should give this a shot because, Aww. you know, if you don't, you know, if you try it and it doesn't work, then you're in the same place you were before anyway. So what do you have to lose? So I threw them together and I, Myself, I don't feel like I have a certain genre that I stick in. Maybe I should do that. I don't know, but I like. Is it romance? No. <laughs> <laughs> Is it comedy? No. I mean, there's some funny it's stuff. Every don't, day. don't, I don't worry about genre, dude. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. like, I, I cling to cosmic stuff a good bit because I love that genre, but I also like psychological stuff. I like mm-hmm. suspense, you know, and I, a lot but of But it's my, the darker side of Sears. Yeah. It's it's a lot of the darker side of stuff. It's the it, beyond it's, of Bed Bath and Beyond. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but like it's past the wall at Walmart. Yes, past the wall. Nice. And, and a lot of my stories if you if you read them you might like no notice that they deal with like woods and mm-hmm. like the beach and the ocean and all that kind of stuff cuz I'm like a nature horror. I'm an avid hiker. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the times I'm in the woods and I'm like, when's my chance going to happen where I find that thing? Right. And I'm just like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have those thoughts a lot in my head and I, mm-hmm. I made a couple stories about that. And so like, it's like a mocking uh, Algernon Blackwood kind of. Yeah. yeah. And and the, the stairs, which was the first story I wrote for Edge of Twilight, the shorts. And it's a one that a lot of people tell me they enjoy. I like that. Um, it's just a simplistic idea of a guy who starts working for a search and rescue team for a fairly large state park. And, uh, he's he, first day he's there. And one of the new trainees is just like, Hey, you want to see something really weird? And takes him out there and he finds out it's this whole hidden thing where they have to bring somebody new out every time. Cause it's a cosmic entity that guards this stuff and it's like if he's not pleased then the whole world can end and it's just a set of stairs out in the middle of an open field somewhere I like. That. and like every place every park essentially that's a big one has their own set of stairs and they're all different but in the all the same thing has to happen and I leave it open mm-hmm. as to like you know did it work did it not work you know and I like I think the thing I like the most about writing is making stories where you fill in the blanks mm-hmm. because I, I like you to be along for the idea. Like I can give you the basis of what I'm trying to do and I can make it scary, but I also want you to put there what it is that's scaring you personally. Right. Right. So, and that's why a lot of stories I write, I kind of have them open ended because I want you to make the 
assumption as to what happened. That and plus, if I ever want to come back to it, it's pretty easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of writers get angry at open endings. I know. Or a lot of readers. Uh, yeah. I mean, or I have not angry at. Open I haven't endings. had anybody tell me they hated it yet. I'm sure there are some, but not everybody's super vocal. Also, you know, I don't know, but. Well, I, I, I in, like doing that. I think in the um, in quiet horror or uh, cosmic horror, mm-hmm. I think open endings generally work because that's the nature of that kind of horror. Right, and you know? I think when you mentioned the different, t- I, I think I lean more toward quiet mm-hmm. horror just because I I've read extreme horror stuff, and some of it's good. I like some of it, but there's also that side of it where I'm just like, this looks like you're literally just flexing. Just to right. try and write something that makes somebody go, oh, that's gross. Mm-hmm. It's a shock value. And me. I rather would, to me, I'd rather write something that has like, to me, feels like it has a substance to it that I'm showing like, hey, look, there is scary things that don't have to be grotesque. Right. So, and that's, that's why I kind of lean more to that side of it. And when I was putting Edge of Twilight together, it was a lot of like, I've had all these ideas in my head for the longest time and, and I'm still like getting them out because I'm on my third short story collection now the second one since I started my Facebook group and I still have plenty of different ideas for shorts in my head that I just you know I'm saving because I either don't know if I want to make novellas out of them or mm-hmm. give them to anthologies and all that kind of stuff but a lot of things I do write also deal with personal issues my mm-hmm. own problems. That's and yeah, like, that's bleeding on the page. Yeah. You're supposed to do that. Uh and the heard. the last story in Edge of Twilight is basically a story about my younger brother. Because he had a lot of well, I mean, I don't say had as in his past. He's still around, but he, <laughs> um I got real dark. <laughs> he he went through a lot of problems with drugs. Mm-hmm. And in the story it's a person trying to right his wrongs, but he can't get rid of the crutch. Right. So, and that, you know, is not necessarily horror in a sense of like, you know, monster, spooky, scary stuff, but it's real life problems that will kill you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's guaranteed if you don't get around it. So. Right. Right. And that's kind of, that's kind of like what I do for my stories. That's what I do. Yeah. (laughs) So I guess that. Now, as a, as a, a new writer putting together your first because uh, he's checked out. Uh, putting together your first thing. <laughs> no, I'm listening. Thing. I'm, I'm um, allowing Matt to have who, a platform who did, and time. Who, who, you can who, ask me questions, too. Did you um? Did, did you go to anyone for, for advice or direction or anything during the process? At that point? Did you have any kind of... Because all beginning writers pretty much have that same issue of... I don't. I don't have. I don't know what a to group. do with this. I don't yeah. have a group yet. <laughs> right. When you're when you're brand new, you don't have that group of people yet. I mean, at that point in time, I knew Brian, and I think I was just coming on here like once a month or something at that point in time. Yeah. But um, I kind of just did it, and I kept it to myself, and then I just put it out there, like you know, and it was like that thing. You know, you just beg your friends and family to get a copy, and then like, oh, if you liked it, tell other people about it, and then they, right. they don't. But now, did you send any of these out to magazines or to anthologies or anything, or did you just write out? I game, just take I just, your stuff into a collection. Yeah, I just put it into a collection and self published it myself. And I was like, it. I sold some. You know, mm-hmm. I was happy with it. Like I can. Is it still available? Yeah, it is still available. It's on Amazon. Yeah, and. I, like I told him, there was a, oh, I can't even remember what freaking episode that was, but I think Jess Epley was on, and we were talking about, like, how you feel if you've made it or not. Yeah. And Yeah, yeah that was Jess's yeah. episode, and I, I believe. I, my answer was, like, if I was able to pay a bill with money that I made from a book, I feel like I made it. And when I sold Edge of Twilight initially, I made enough to pay my car payment for that month. That's fucking yeah, great. So awesome. I was like, yeah. I feel like I did good. You yeah. Know? So that's why I keep going, you know, mm-hmm. even though it might not look great sometimes. I, <laughs> I keep trying. But I, I, you know, I always, you know, the, like when you're starting out, you have that grand ambition. You're like, oh, I'm going to be the next this person and that person. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, I'd like to just be at least known in my area as a guy who writes good stories. Right. I'm not right. looking to be like King because I don't even think I want to deal with that kind of shit. Um, <laughs> no. I could deal you know. with fame and fortune. No, you don't. 
Um, and and all love and respect to Steve. Like the last twenty years, Mary and Kelly will tell you I have had my fair share of crazies. Well, yeah, I, I <laughs> yeah. was here for that whole and, comic book and, shit. And <laughs> I don't say crazies derogatorily against mentally ill people, but I, I'm talking about legitimate, you know, people who legitimately mean to do Want me to harm me, and yes. have the means to do me harm simply right. for who I am. Right. Okay. Steve deals with that exponentially, and I've known that over the years, but I didn't get a taste of what it's like for him mm-hmm. until Twitter. Any time he retweets me or responds to a tweet, just the other day, we're we're having a, I can't remember what the what the subject was. I think it was Carl Ever Wagner sticks, or maybe it was uh you know a motorcycle road trip to California. It's something innocuous like that. Immediately, people turn it into politics and fuck right. you guys, and MAGA. And I'm like, motherfucker. First of all, you don't even know how I voted. I didn't vote for Trump, but. Right. You know, you don't know that. Where's he has them coming out of the woodwork. So, yeah, I agree. Never, never, no. ever, ever do I want to be that big. I just want to I just want to be at that I'd point like where because I don't think a female has. Hmm. I'd like to be that. I, I'm okay. No, that's a good point. I think I have. No. Well, mm, no, not in the same. Not, not in the same, same genre. genre. She, yeah, she's done wonderful, but she doesn't have the same level of. Crazy, she does well. She also doesn't crank them out JK like he Rowling does. Probably, probably is. JK yeah. probably JK does. Yeah. But I mean, in, I was talking about in horror. In horror, yeah. So yeah, yeah I mean, and I, I, yeah. I think I have the right temperament for fame and fortune. <laughs> I can handle it. I'm willing to try. I'm willing to I try. I would like to prove it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Prove that I can do it. I would it. like to see that. <laughs> well, Mary, what about you? Let's talk about uh, the origin of the Hollower. Talk Hollower. about your first novel. Well, um. Or actually, you wrote Thrall before you wrote the Hollower. Technically, right? technically, I wrote most of Thrall before the Hollower. All right, we'll pick one. Uh, I, the Hollower is my first <laughs> book, my first published book. Right. So that's that's what I would that's what I would consider my first novel. Um, it was one of the first books I ever blurbed. Yes, so we, it was. We were just friends back then. The, and you wrote me a beautiful uh, introduction, actually. I did. Yeah. You know, I, I I I really love that introduction. Um, yeah. No, I had always wanted to be a writer, uh, I, among other things. I mean, you know, people sort of have these dream jobs that that they want. But being a writer was always as appealing to me a job as being a, a, like a rock star or, uh, you know, anything else, you know, anything else like in childhood, like that you think, oh, it'd be cool to do that when I grow up. Uh, I didn't really realize probably till high school, though, that it was an actual job that people had. Uh, and I think it was probably Stephen King. It was reading some kind of nonfiction piece he did about like sitting in the backyard, like having lemonade with his agent and talking shop. And I'm like, Oh wow. Like this is a life that people have where they write stories for a living. And I decided that's why I, I, without question, never looked back. That's what I want to do. But you know, it's not the kind of job where, I mean, uh, the, the area I grew up in, I, I would say is probably, uh, was like an upper middle-class, uh, area of New Jersey. Um, and so college was a thing that they pushed. So, you know, in high school, I said, I want to be a writer. They said, go to college. Okay. In college, I said, I want to be a writer. They said, oh, well, we got nothing for you. You could try the job placement, you know, the job placement office and see what they have. Uh, and it wasn't until I started working that I got into writing uh, fiction, like beyond poetry, I guess, because I, I tried a couple of short stories and... I was, I was a little bit like, you know, I'd like dip my foot into like sending that out to magazines and whatnot. Uh, and I wrote, but I, I knew that eventually I wanted to write a novel. I mean, I had tried to write a novel, I think when I was like 18 or 19, maybe a little bit older, uh-huh. maybe like 20. Uh, and I, I didn't have the, the stamina for it and I didn't understand, uh, the scope of a novel to be able to plan it out to be a novel length. Right. Book. You know, since so it's like a skill sets that you develop as you go along. Um, it's great. They had always told us, you know, write short stories first and then work up to a novel. But the short story is a different skill than a novel. Mm-hmm. It requires a different mindset, mm-hmm. I think. A different uh, paring down or building up of something. 
So right. um, I had attempted to write novels. The Hollower is the first one I actually finished. And part of that was because I was at a dead end job. Um, I was at a point in life. It was probably like people say, you know, you have that midlife crisis, but you have many crises along the way. Yeah. And one of them was in my twenties. I was probably about 25 or 26 or something like that. And, uh, I was not happy with my job. I wasn't going anywhere. And so I fell back on what people had always told me was the way to move forward, which was go to school and learn something. So um, even my parents growing up, they were always very supportive. Like, you want to be a writer? That's great. Go to school to learn how to do it well. Okay. So I went for my master's. And I, I found this. I, at the time, I was a single mother with a, with a baby. And uh, I found a program where I wouldn't have to go away to school for a long time. It was something I could do mostly online. I wouldn't even have to go to classes once a week. Um, I just basically checked in. Uh, with my critique partners and my advisor. And, and then twice a year, I'd have to go for a week and take classes at the actual school. And my parents were great. They watched my, my, my child for me while I was away. Um, and the premise of the program was that you had to write a thesis novel. And it, because it was not a creative writing major, but an actual commercial fiction, popular fiction major, uh, the premise was that you had to write a novel that could be commercially sellable in the marketplace in your genre. Okay. So the advisors that you had were published authors in speculative fiction. Um, I was very lucky. One of my advisors for, I guess, a good half of my time there was Gary Brombeck, who I, uh, totally hero worshiped in terms of, you know, in his writing, um, when I first started out writing, I just thought, you know, he was, he was a phenomenal writer. He still is. Uh, and he was, he was one of my advisors and he worked with Don Doria, who was the uh, senior editor at leisure books at the time. And leisure books, uh, was, a uh, uh, I guess one of the Holy grails of publishing at that time. Uh, leisure books was doing mass market horror, uh, across the boards. I think they did something like 24 books a year. Yeah, because it was two a month. Because it was two a month. Mm -hmm. And um, all of the major players, as I saw it in horror, other than, you know, like Stephen King, um, pretty much everybody else was publishing with leisure. Yep. Like, that was the way to go. That was how you got your foot in the door. I knew that Don, um, I knew that he read the short story magazines, that he, he kept kind of an eye out for, you know, up-and-coming writers. Uh, I knew that a lot of the, the folks I admired and, and I talked to knew him and were publishing with him. Um, and I'd met him a few times. I, I we were friendly, we, you know, uh, we were well, actually, I guess I'd, I'd known him for kind of a while by then, you know, and, and, and we were very friendly. And so I pulled a Brian Keene, <laughs> actually, <laughs> I volunteered that year for the Stokers to set up pitch meetings. My job was to coordinate all of the agents and, and editors who were coming to hear pitches with people that I thought that they would most likely be able to, like with writers that would most likely, you know, be bought by these publishers. So it was a matter of kind of, you know, knowing what they were, you know, what their book was about and, 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 and what their plans were and, and, and just coordinating this the right way. One of the things I said to Don was, you know, hey, you know, here are the people that I've, you know, set up to do pitches with you. Would you mind if at the end of the day, if you're not too tired, you let me buy you a drink and talk to you about my book? I said, I, I'm i going, to, you know, I'm doing this master's program with Seton Hill in popular fiction. Gary Bronbeck, one of your authors, is my advisor. Uh you know, he's helping me not just write a horror, a competent horror novel, but a commercially sellable horror novel. And that was the problem with Thrall in the beginning was that when people were still so hung up on genre labels, they weren't sure how to market Thrall. They liked the book, but they didn't know how to market it. To me, it's cosmic horror, but I guess at the time it was but that a little didn't bit, exist at the little, time. Yeah, it was it a didn't little have too a surreal. Title at the yeah, time. it was a little too surreal for commercial fiction. And I explained the premise of of the novel, and he said, "Yeah, you know, so." I had sent him the first three chapters and uh, before the pitch sessions. And then, at, you know, after the pitch sessions, you know, we met up at the bar, you know, we had, so this is back when I drank, we had some drinks. <laughs> um, and, you know, we finally got around, you know, we, we just chit chatted and we finally got around to talking about, uh, 
my novel. And he said, I read the first three chapters and I loved it. If the rest of the book is as good as the beginning, I'll buy it. And I was like, and I said, well, here's the great part. I said, because at this point, this is probably like June. I said, the book has to be done by December. I said, because that's when I'm graduating. I'm graduating in January. So everything has to be done by December. Um, I can send you the book when it's done. And he said, great. So uh, I did that. And back in that day, uh, New York publishers, if they wanted to buy your book, they didn't send you an email. They didn't send you a response letter. They called you on the phone. That's how you knew you got accepted. Mm -hmm. So every time, you know, you saw that letter come in the mail, it's like, oh, this is a rejection because otherwise they would have called. And I, I got this phone call at work from a new New York number and I answered it and it was Don. And basically I was so dumbfounded <laughs> that I agreed to everything. He's just like, oh, you know, I really liked it. I want to buy the book. Here's the terms. Here's the advance, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Cause I was just so excited. And, uh, and that was the beginning of my working relationship with, with Don and Leisure. That's how I got my first book published. It worked out both ways because I think part of the reason they were inspired to buy it, part of the, the, the selling point of it was that it was having academic and editorial oversight throughout the whole process because it was my thesis novel for school. And then for the school, it made them look good because one of their master's students was publishing with, you know, a major publisher in her genre. So it worked out both ways. It worked, it, uh, it, it worked out for me, obviously, but I think it made, uh, both other parties happy because there was that, in, that interconnectedness there. So, right. um, that, that was my, that was the hollower. And then after that, um, you know, after a few hollower books, because the first one was popular enough that they asked me to do two other ones, um, the, then I could sell thrall. So it was a matter of not, you know, cause I thrall to me, that was, that was my baby. That was the one I loved the most, but, uh, but I could see from, from having gone through this program, I could see why it was not commercially viable at the time. Sometimes that book you love, it's not that it's not good enough. It's just that you have to wait till you are in a position to, uh, be able to get it moving and get it up. Like, I think people bought thrall because by that point I had developed a readership from the Holler book. So. Um, that's my story. Kelly, what about you? Um, I wrote a book. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> uh, my first novel, my first novel was actually not six days, but we're going to talk about my first published novel, which was six days. Uh, my first finished novel, I was 19 and it was actually fantasy based. And it got rejected by everybody in New York, including some bum on Fifth Avenue who said, just never come to our city again. <laughs> and and I'm really glad it did, because otherwise uh, Hickman and Weiss would have sued the shit out of me. Uh, it was my love of everything D&D and the Dragonlance series. Aww. And I just completely raped all of it. Because that's what you do as a young writer. You write what you, you write know. What you, you write know, what you, you love. Hell, you I retype Stephen King's The you Mist know. word for word yeah. you know, <laughs> while I was sitting in detention. You know, I, think that's yeah. a, I think that's a good technique. We can yeah, no, we do that. that. So then um, for a long time I wasn't writing because I did not have the thick enough skin to deal with rejections. It, I mean, it really hit me hard um, because it was everyone. And this was, I'm old. So this was back in the day, you know, before the whole internet, I had to go and I had to get the writer's digest. Mm -hmm. And I had a recipe box with cards for each publisher, who the current person oh was God, to send so it to. Oh my God, you're so organized. I mean, I still have that. I found it the other day. Um, I've got everyone in oh there. I've got like God. Avon. I've got everyone in there. Uh, so I had done what you had to do back in the day to get it out there. And everybody went, yeah, no, we're good. Um, Kate so I quit. I had babies. I did that for a bit. Um, but I was still writing. I was writing short stories and just kind of burying them in a file. And then I started on my second novel, which is actually not finished. Um, because I got sidetracked by horror web. Uh, and that was more along the case car pedal line for anyone who knows what she does. That was more like police procedural yeah. uh, type thing because I was reading those and I really love those. And because I was the Koontz kid in the, in the group, you know, I was the one who was reading the thrillers and the mysteries yeah. and the, I wasn't necessarily reading horror. I did, but it wasn't my bookshelf was far more fantasy thriller and it's interesting because Coons is, is more of an action-based yeah. 
uh, horror than Stephen King, and yeah. I think that does influence how you write. And it does. Yeah. It absolutely I does. I have a question, though, because we've covered some of this when you're on the show as a guest, mm -hmm. but keep in mind, back then, none of us knew you were writing. No, so, well, I was going to get there. No, I, I was going to get there. But, but... I have a new question. Okay. I didn't know at the time that you were doing short stories. I never knew that until just now. Mm -hmm. Were you submitting those? At no, all? no, no, okay. no. I was a giant chicken shit. Okay. Um, giant chicken shit. Um, then I was doing, uh, my husband at the time moved me into the middle of actual nowhere. Like it's a spot on the map. <laughs> nowhere. <laughs> nowhere. You live nowhere. And I had no friends there. I had nothing to do. The internet was shiny and new. So I created Horror Web. And I had this, for people who don't know, I had this huge genre website uh, with a staff of 13. And we did reviews and news mm -hmm. and all kinds of crazy things. And I met actors and actresses and writers and publishers and editors through that. Mm -hmm. And I still wasn't submitting <laughs> <laughs> I still was not so I was what what I referred to it as I was advertising for the people who had the balls to do what I didn't have the balls to do. Okay. So I mean I I met Brian because I was doing advertising for him. Yep. I met Bob because Bob was who I got the advertising banners from. Okay. <laughs> like right. literally. Um and then uh we were at a horror find. And, and I had become, because my reviews were really honest, uh, kind of like what I just did scary. you in the kitchen yeah, out there. Yeah, yeah. Scary. So they were, or scary, as they we've were discussed. Scary. And a lot of the writers said, okay, we don't want you to review us anymore. We would like you to edit us before it gets to that <laughs> stage. So then I became editor for everybody. For myself, for everybody. James Moore, a lot of people. Yeah, I was editing for a lot, a lot, a lot of people. And so then we were at Horrified. And I was working on a novel which had sort of maybe started during a um, November, what are, what are they? Oh, the NaNoWriMo. The, the NaNoWriMo thing. Uh, the year before, I had kind of been like, oh, okay, I want to try it something longer. Let's do this. And I had it with me because I was kind of, I was going to go through it over the weekend. The little bit that I had, I had like 30,000 words or something. And I was going to kind of go through it and decide what can I keep? What can I trash? You know, where can I go from here? So I was rooming with Brian and I learned that Brian and Lumpy, which is what I call Jim Moore. None of you are allowed to call him that. <laughs> only me. Uh, and, and these two men that I loved and adored and looked up to and helped advertise their shit and edit their shit went in my suitcase <laughs> while I was in the shower. And um, saw a manuscript. What it was was they saw the papers at the edge, so they what? had to go snooping. <laughs> and they thought no, it was I, someone else's book that I was I editing. Need, I need to clarify. It's, so, it's not like Jim Moore and I said, oh, let's see what kind of underwear Kelly wears. Uh, I, we, that's where I was going. Like, we saw, we saw know, the right? manuscript sticking out of her suitcase. They wondered who I was editing. And, you know, Jim says, what's that look like to you? And I said, it looks like a manuscript. And he said it. She's cheating on us. She's pre-reading for someone else. Oh, and I pre-reading for I so said, many people. At let's that find point. out who and kick their ass. <laughs> so we pulled it out, and yes, please. And, and then it had my name on it, and all hell broke loose. So I get out of the shower, and I walk around the corner, drying my hair off, and uh, I've got my clothes on. No, I was going to say no towels. I've got my no, I've got my clothes on. <laughs> And I'm drying my hair and I walk around the corner and I can see the two of them outside the sliding glass door sitting at the little table. And they each have a chunk of paper in their oh. hands. And they're reading and they're whispering and they're pointing and there was, and I, and I think my heart literally stopped, like just stopped. <laughs> and I, I dropped the towel and I walked out there like, what are you doing? Like I wanted to be mad, but I was so afraid. I didn't know how to be oh. mad. I was terrified. So I walk out there and Brian, cause he's a dick. Brian goes, <laughs> you use the word darkness way too much. Everybody, every horror writer, that's the first thing yeah, they tell you is like, six find days, another word for darkness. But six days is written in, in the, the dark. dark. Right. So you use darkness way too much. And Jim says, and you've got until October to finish it and send it to us. And Aww. I went, Oh fuck. So I had to finish six days. That's awesome. Which originally was called like in the shadow of darkness or some in other the darkity darkness of dark. gothic awful teenage <laughs> title. And um, so meanwhile, all right. So that that's how it started. Then it gets just weird and twisted in there. I sent the book. We're not going to talk about that. I sent the book to a publisher. 
who had it, who wanted it, who loved it, right? Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, I had still kept up with Horror Web. I was right. still sending things out. I was, you know, and I had been like, well, I'm going to send out a story and see what happens. So I sent out a short story. Um, and it was like within a half hour, it was accepted. And I ended up winning whatever the thing was. And I have a $5 bill and an empty bag of tw- Twizzlers somewhere, <laughs> you know, as proof that this happened. And, um, so then I started submitting. And one of the people I was reading, because I was still in kindergarten when I realized you could be a writer, I was like, oh, I don't have to be a librarian. I can be a writer. Uh, cause books is like, I've always just yeah. been, it's all about books. And because I was reading everything I could get to at that point, uh, I was reading a lot of Thunderstorm and I emailed Paul. And I literally, and this is like no shame. This is the worst thing. I literally emailed him and he knew who I was because of horror web. And so I introduced myself instead as, well, I write and I see you have a giant lack of females in the stable and I would like to be in the stable. I'd like to be your filly. <laughs> and he was like, well, what do you have? So I sent him Waiting Out Winter uh-huh. and he loved it. So Waiting Out Winter was actually written after six days, but published first. Yep. Huh. Um, and to make things worse, at the same time, the short thing's going out. There's a story that was in Shroud called The Man Who Slept Through Tomorrow, which is tied to Waiting Out Winter, which actually came out before Waiting Out Winter. <laughs> so, like, things came out, like, in this weird order. And then the publisher who had Six Days flaked, mm-hmm. just as Paul saying, well, do you have anything longer? And Brian and I had a real, I remember that day. I remember when the publisher flaked and you and I had that phone call. Because I, I was getting ready to launch my Maelstrom imprint. Yeah, he was getting ready to launch Maelstrom, and that happened, and I had moved out of the ex-husband's house with the kids, and my life was upheaval. Yes. Okay, I'm going to go through a divorce. I have two kids I have to worry about. My book is no longer getting fucking published. I mean, it was like chaos, and it was midnight, and I'm on the phone with Brian, like, crying in my all-but-empty new kitchen, going, I can't believe he's doing this to me. It's been two years he's had this fucking book, and And he was like, well, how do you feel about... So, Paul, who had already worked with me and loved me, and Brian starting Maelstrom, said, well, we'll just do this. We'll just, yeah. We'll take that off your hands if you don't (laughs) mind. So, it was, like, a really weird way for it to get there. But I find that but that that's happens. how it got there. Yeah, I mean, it was just such a weird path that I traveled. And everybody's like, oh, but you're friends with Brian. That's why you're published. No. 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 <laughs> Not at all. Think about I get that, too. <laughs> I've, I've Not had, at all. I've had plenty of I published friends. because I was afraid of Jim Moore. <laughs> I've, I've had plenty of friends try to get into Maelstrom, and I've told them, no, this, this book no. doesn't work for me. No. Um, and I'd like, I'd and like Paul the record to loved show. Six Days. He and his wife were like, this is the best first novel I've ever read. And Dallas was so mad at me. Oh, my God. Why did Jim Moore get to do the introduction for this book? I mean, he was mad. And I was like, oh, I, because, well, he found it. I mean, he, and he, he found it. Brian published it, and Jim had to do the intro because they the ones that found it. So yeah, it was it was a whole thing. Well, speaking of Dallas, I'll retell mine, but I'm going to do the Cliff Notes version because I I want to get to the guest panel. But um, for for new listeners who never heard the story, I wrote eight practice novels, what we call trunk novels, mm-hmm. meaning they were they were practicing practice know, at writing a novel. I know where he keeps them. Um, one of them isn't even hard. It's, it's basically like my version of Fast Times at Richmond High. So nice. Hey, okay, I wrote Dragonlance. I have yeah, no shame. Yeah, you know. Um, but I, I was working on a novel at the time. It was called Cabin Fever. And it was it was just a guy stuck in his bomb shelter during the zombie apocalypse. And the whole novel was going to be right, him stuck inside. Right, I remember inside. that, yeah. Years later, I would recycle that into a novel called Entombed. But, you know, I had that. And uh, it wasn't really going anywhere. There was no heart to it. And then at the time, my oldest son, who is now 29, lived in New Jersey with his mother. And I was driving to, to see him for the weekend, and it was a blizzard, and they declared state of emergency. No one's allowed on the road unless you're an emergency vehicle or the National Guard. So the National Guard flags me down. 
And like, sir, you got to get off the road. There's a rest stop up ahead. I'm like, absolutely, you know, ignoring. Sorry, you. sorry about that. Uh, I I sure will. You gentlemen, be safe. And as soon as they were out of sight, I kept going. And I thought, well, men with machine guns didn't stop me from getting to see my son. What would <laughs> zombies? No, but that would be a really cool fucking novel. And by the time I got home, it clicked. So I scrapped Cabin Fever, used the same character in the same setting, a father stuck in a bomb shelter. But then it became this novel called More Than Infinity. Mm -hmm. um, I finished it. It was very, very long. And I showed it to Richard Lehman. He saw the, he, he volunteered. I wasn't going to bother him. Matt, probably like you. Kelly, probably like you. You guys didn't want to show me your first, you know, the first things. I didn't show you. Well, in a way you did. No, you went out. in my damn suitcase. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, but Layman, Layman offered. He said, you know, let me, let me take a look at it. And, uh, I sent it to him. Oh my God, you know. <clears throat> and, uh, he wrote me back and he said, you know, it needs to be about half the length it is now. And he gave me some other changes. He's, he's you know, he, he was kind enough to give me a blurb based on that oh. first draft. But he said, but you got to make these changes. So I did. And, uh, we were at a convention and he introduced me to Don Daria at Leisure Books. He said, you know, Brian's got a zombie novel. I think you should take a look at it. And Don said, zombies. Oh, nobody's done those for about a de decade. You know, the last one had been yeah, Phil Nutman's wet work. Yep. Mm -hmm. He goes, yeah, I'll take a look at it. In the meantime, Delirium Books also wanted a novel from me based on the success of four by four. So I gave Delirium. More than Infinity, he bought the the hardcover rights. Mm -hmm. uh, Don Daria emailed me and said, uh, "Hey, are you going to be at this this upcoming convention?" And I said, "Yeah." And he said, "Okay, I'll see you there. I'll have something for you." That something turned out to be a contract. <laughs> um, I know I've told that story on the air. I walked into the bar like, "What the fuck do I do now? I need an agent. How do I get one of those?" Dallas and a napkin. Yeah. Dallas, aka yeah. Jack Ketchum. Uh, if you've listened to you know, catch him's appearance on the show. You know, he used to be an agent mm -hmm. for Henry Miller, mm -hmm. for Philip K. Dick, etc., And for Jack Ketchum. <laughs> yeah. You know, he says, what you got there, kiddo? Good job. You know, and, 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 cause at that time we weren't Dallas and Brian. He was Mr. Ketchum and I was kiddo. He says, what you got there, kiddo? I said, I, I got a contract. He says, do you have an agent? No. All right. Well, buy me a bottle of doers and find me a red pen and I'll negotiate it for you. And I, I distinctly remember shouting to the bar, does anyone have a red pen? <laughs> I need a red pen! <laughs> but by God, he did. Um, and then I found out that Dick Lehman had been talking to him about the novel. You know, Dick had died at this point. Um, but, but, you know, he had, he had mentioned the novel to Dallas. So that was really fucking cool. So, uh, yeah, Delirium brought out the hardcover 2003. Leisure brought out the paperback a few months later in 2004. It accidentally hit the bestseller list. And the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> now, what, what point, though, did they make you change the name of it? Well, that was early on. Uh, Delirium's galleys were actually set for more than infinity. Mm. Like, that was going to yeah. be the title. And the one... The one thing Leisure stuck to their guns on was we, you have to make it a more commercial title. And you know what? I didn't always agree with Leisure's title changes. Mm -hmm. You know, Dark Hollow was originally the rutting season. Right, right. I still prefer the rutting season. Obviously, I prefer Earthworm Gods over the Conqueror Worms. But in the case of The Rising, I get it. Yeah. I hate well, they made me change. We should have a change, whole episode uh, about that. Found you. Uh, they I said, hated the Deceiver change. Well, they said "Found You" sounds like a romance title, and I said, "Okay, well, we could change it." Because I'm, I'm never really hung up on titles. It's very, very rare that I ever come up with a title that I think like I love this title. Don't touch it. Most of the time, they, I mean, they want to call it like Napkin Space. I'm like, all right, whatever, whatever you think sells it. You know, it's I was begging Paul to come up with a title for six days. Like we have a, I have emails. We had like a list of fifteen titles at one point. We're like, yeah. any of these work for you? Yeah, well, like, that's we what I would do. Nothing. I would send. I would send lists of titles. I said, well, we can maybe call it this or this or this or this. And then Don would pick the one he liked the best. Kensington did that too a couple of times because, um, I'm just, titles is not my thing. So they, 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 they decided found you sounded too much like a romance. So then they changed it to like two or three other things. And then he comes back to me and says, well, marketing decided that the best thing that we can probably call this is found you. I'm like, oh, all right. So hmm. 
See, after Dark Hollow, they never got to change another of my titles. I hated and, the and, Earthworm and, Gods. And quite, quite frankly, it, it, it is legitimately a case of privilege. By that point, I was selling well enough that, that, that I could tell marketing, go pound. Go mm. pound sand. We're calling it ghoul. We're calling it urban coffee. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, let's go to our panelists. But before we do that, just want to remind folks about our friends at Adam and Eve. Dot com. Uh, if you go there right speaking now. Speaking of pounding sand. Yeah, speaking of pounding, if you're in the mood to pound <laughs> sand this weekend. All right. No, do a, do a little browsing there, do a little shopping, and when you're done, at checkout, use the offer code KEEN. That's K-E-E-N-E. You'll receive a discount, 10 free tantalizing gifts, discreet shipping, and more only at adamandeve.com. All right. So, we got J. Edwin Buja, Mary Hart. Michelle Renee Lane, Sherry Sebastian Gabriel, and Tony Tremblay. They're going to talk with me about the joys and terrors of writing, publishing, and promoting their first novel. And then we'll catch you on the flip side. All right. Um, this is the, uh, the I wrote my first novel panel. I don't think that's the actual description, but Chris didn't provide me with a printout, so that's what we're calling it. Um, I'm Brian Keene. Oh, we have a printout right here. It's called Writing Your First Novel, so I was close. Um, I wrote my first novel in 99 and 2000. It was published in 2003, and I've written 52 books since then. Um, but I don't want to talk about that first novel. What I want to talk about oh, but now is we y'all's hear about first it. novels. <laughs> yeah. um, so let's just let's start here to my left. Go down, introduce yourselves. Uh, tell us the title of your, your first book. Uh, I'm Sherry Sebastian Gabriel. My first novel, Spirits, uh, is out now from Hero House Publishing. Mary Hart. Not the Entertainment Tonight co-host, <laughs> and I wrote Some Horrific Evening two years ago. Uh, I'm Michelle Renee Lane, and I wrote Invisible Chains, also with Haver Hill. I'm John Booyah, and I wrote The King of the Wood with Haverhill House. I'm Tony Trumpy, and I wrote The Moore House, and I wrote that a little over a year ago. Is that also with Haverhill House? It is, yes, with Haverhill House. <laughs> I, I, I noticed yes, a trend here. here. Yeah, I self-published. <laughs> didn't, write, didn't publish with Haverhill House. Uh, you know, with, with writing advice, um, I mean, the, the Internet is full of writing advice, both good and bad. And there's a lot of adages out there about, oh, you should write a couple practice novels or trunk novels before you publish your true first novel. And there's the adage of, you know, you should start with short stories before you write a novel. But every writer's journey is different. I always point to Tom Piccarelli, for example, one of the most acclaimed writers of my generation, who the very first thing he wrote was his first novel. And it wasn't a Trump novel. It got published. Now, Tom would tell you it was a bad novel. And he was right. It was a bad <laughs> novel. But he, he sold that before he ever wrote a short story. Um, every writer's journey is different. So, I, you know, um, and it, it's the same for all of you. Tony, you know, you started out a reviewer and you did two short story collections. You know, uh, you know, Mary, you... You were writing about aliens meet Princess Diana in the fifth grade. Uh, you know, Michelle, you won a short story contest at age 12, but your first published thing was, uh, you know, academic. Yeah. Um, you know, and on and on. So uh, start, we started with Sherry last time. Tony, let's start with you. What was your your journey to your first novel? Like, like what, what did you do beforehand? Uh, as you mentioned, I was a... Uh reviewer for Horror World. It's a website that Nancy Galanta runs. Uh, in fact, that's how I pretty much met Brian and so many other authors through Horror World. Uh, and I developed a rapport with them, and he mentioned Tom Piccarelli. And, and Tom used to, I won't say, he used to encourage me to write. And uh, back then I was playing with short stories and uh, I would be, you know, sending him my short stories, and he would read it, and he'd be sending me his novels, and I would be reviewing them. Uh, so sometimes I'd see his novels before they were published, and we got to talk a little bit about the process and how he did his editing. And then one day, it had nothing to do with sending stories or novels back and forth. We were on uh, Horror World, and I wrote this maybe three-paragraph thing. Uh, it was about my wife, who's a born-again Christian, uh, let me go to a, a convention called Nikon. And he read it, and he said, Tony, 
you're ready to write a novel. And I'd never considered writing a novel until he said that. Uh, and it, it gave me the self-confidence I needed to at least attempt. Uh, and I did write a, a novel, and it, it's a trunk novel. It's still, it's still down in the basement where it'll stay. But I did do it, you know, and I, in a roundabout way, I have Tom to thank for that. Mr. Booger, what about you? Uh, yeah, I was out of work back in the 90s and uh, decided to write. So I, I wrote a couple of children's books that were um, fairly short, and then I wrote a novel about digging up the backyard, which was longer, and then a young reader's novel, which was longer, uh, none, of, none of which have gone any, well, the two big novels haven't, but, uh, and then in 2000, I started, got an idea and started writing it, and I finished it in 2016, because I kept working. And, uh, so you started it in 2000, finished it in 2016. Yeah, yeah. Although if you take away all the times I wasn't working on it when I was doing yeah. like a job, probably would have taken me about a year and a half. Yeah. But I'm lazy. <laughs> Michelle, what about you? Um, so I don't know. I wrote uh, a, a horrific amount of Duran Duran fan fiction. Oh, was it? <laughs> I want to read, read that. that. Yeah. And, uh, you and Neil Gaiman. Yeah. David Lee Roth and Simon Lee Bond. That, yeah. that was I'm my intrigued. North and South in high school. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, but then I, I wrote a bunch of uh, creepy poetry that my friends really liked, and um, started writing longer things. And um, then I went to college and was told that um, genre fiction was not serious writing. Ooh. And if I wanted to publish short stories, I had to be more literary. Um, but somewhere in between, those two things kind of came together, and I wrote my first novel. Yeah. Mary. I did indeed start writing about aliens and Princess Diana in fifth grade. <laughs> it was because I was seeing a speech therapist at the time because I could not do S and SHs. I would confuse them. So she sells seashells by the seashore hate. Awful. Just awful. So they wanted me to write lots of stories that had S's and SH's in it and then read them. And so I wrote those, start found I liked it, and then I started writing stories for my mom and my dad, who are both horror, they love horror. And I thought I was still writing stories about Princess Diana and aliens and all that, and I found a couple years ago a notebook that I'd given to my mom on her 40th birthday, and there were horror stories in there about elevators and people cats that are invisible and scratch people while they're sleeping and I was like wait in a haunted house and I was like wait I, I've been doing this since then I had no idea mm -hmm. and I write professionally for work so I've been writing for the Boston Globe uh, articles advertorials the Eagle Tribune um, you know email copy white papers all that stuff so I've been writing my whole life but this book came to me when I was freelance writing, and it came to me literally in a dream about a house where things kept morphing, and I kind of figured out where it came from since then and wrote it over the course of three years. Sherry? Um, yeah, I, I think I've been writing stories since I was about, I don't know, seven or eight. Um, and when I got into college, my experience was a lot like Michelle's, where everyone was like, mm, horror and science fiction, those things are just, you know, not legitimate. Um, but I had the advantage of having a uh, professor who was a science fiction writer and who basically encouraged that in me. Um, and, you know, I think I've been trying to sell stories since I was about 15 or so. And as I've gone along, I've gotten better at it and I've become more successful at it. And I do have a trunk novel and it will never see the light of day. <laughs> but, but I think it's important. It's important to, I think trunk novels are important because I think they teach you that you can do it. And mm -hmm. if you sit down and, you know, you can do this thing from beginning to end, you know, the next one you do better and so forth. And I think that you just improve by doing it. But um, I began, <laughs> I began Spirits in uh, 2018 and... Uh, I wrote the vast majority of it in two weeks, which is a pretty funny story, um, because my now fiancé, Matt Bechtel, um, stayed on me about a um, pitch that I did to my publisher, John McElveen, and he said, oh, so have you, uh, have you sent him a synopsis yet? And I'm like, I'm not even done with the novel. I still got like half of it to write. And he was like, no, I think you should really send him the synopsis. And I sent it, and I thought, oh, I've got... I've got easily a month to finish this novel. <laughs> so the next day, <laughs> I get an email from Max saying, I want your manuscript. And then I was like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so I finished the novel in two weeks. <laughs> wow. 
I want to I want to circle back around to something John said. You know, the the 2000 to 2016. Uh, mm-hmm. If I can just make a quick point, I something I completely forgot. Yeah, about absolutely. I'm, I'm old and now retired. <laughs> Between 2000 and uh, 2018, I also wrote about 40 technical manuals. Oh, which is why I didn't. Yeah. Uh huh. That would do it. Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that kind of sucked everything you know, out. Exactly. Like, a quick aside. Uh, author J. F. Gonzalez, of course, known to anybody who reads hard. Uh, when he passed on, I was put in charge of his literary estate. People don't know, in addition to all the horror novels he did, he was a tech writer. Oh. Mm-hmm. But he kept a copy of every tech manual and everything he'd ever mm-hmm. done. So I'm going through his files, and not only are there unpublished novels, but there's like, you know, how to assemble your new vacuum cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a horror yeah, novel. <laughs> I joked I should put together a collection of those. Like, here's all the tech manuals he wrote. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you're retired. Uh, the rest of you still have day jobs? Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. No, Tony, you're okay. Mm-hmm. What I want to talk about, how many of you want to be a writer, have not yet published your first novel? It's okay. Raise your hands. All right. Most of you, I'm assuming, probably still have day jobs, right? Mm-hmm. This is what we want to talk about. Yep. Um, because, as I said at the beginning, there's all kinds of advice and adages, but every person's journey is different. So, Sherry, we're going to go back to you. Talk about finding the time. To work on that first novel when you've got, I mean, you're engaged to Bechtel. That's a full time <laughs> job right there. It, um, it is. You know, yes. When do you find, when, when did you find, did you have a set schedule? Did you work on it just whenever? Um, you know, I, I think that you have to just, it's not a matter of finding the time, it is just making mm-hmm. time. You have to literally put it in your schedule. You know, if it means waking up early, if it means, you know, staying up late, um, you know, lunch breaks, whatever it takes, if that's important to you, you fit it in, you find the time. You, you literally have to make mm-hmm. the time. So, Yeah, for me, I wrote the book over a period of three years, but the majority of it, 50,000 words of it, I wrote in a month through um, Nano Remo, which was National Novel mm-hmm. Reading Month, and apparently I'm doing it again next month. <laughs> Thanks to Capri in the front yard. And so I did this for. It's basically you have to write a certain amount of words in the month, fifty thousand words in a month, and that's sorted out by day. And I do really well when I have things to keep track of or that I have to, you know, check off a list. And so that was one thousand one hundred and sixty six or something like that words every single day. There are some days I didn't do that, so then I had to write three thousand the next day. But you know, having that and that basically the ability to be able to go online and say, okay, I did this and check it off or put in what you did. It's that accountability. That's what made me do it. So it meant, you know, coming home from work and eating dinner and then taking an hour or two to just sit and write. Mm -hmm. Hmm. (laughs) Yeah, I've tried NaNoWriMo like four times. (laughs) I'm never going to, I'm never going to be able to do that. Um, So yeah, I work full time and I'm a single mom. Um, and there's not a lot of time to like do dishes or vacuum <laughs> either. So, um, writing, uh, this, this book, um, I wrote in the space of three years and it was an MFA, my, for my mm-hmm. MFA thesis. So I had to write it because there was a grade attached to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had a lot of support through the program and I made a lot of connections with um, a lot of other writers and they were very supportive and kept cheering me on. Um, I'm very lucky to have those people in my life. I don't know how I would have done it without those people. Um, but yeah, I stayed up late. I got up early. Um, I was fortunate enough to have an office with a door and <laughs> that at work and write at work, um, whatever it takes. Um, yeah, excuse me. Uh, being in high tech, I got laid off a lot because you know if you if you last in a job more than two years, you're lucky, right? mm-hmm. at least as a tech writer. So I would you know have six months and I would blast out you know half the novel, and then work for six years, mm-hmm. and not write a word. Um, so I'm, I'm much better at deadlines. I did a couple of the um, Borderlands workshops where I had to have something to send in, so that forced me to do some more of the book, and then I. I was going on a cruise and uh, heading for Nikon uh, in 2016, and uh, Jim Moore said, the book better be finished by the time you get here. So I actually <laughs> finished it crossing the Atlantic. <laughs> no, don't, don't, yeah. no, don't disappoint Jim. Never, and, never. <laughs> I, I finished it, and then uh, Mac read it. I hadn't 
realized that I had given it to Mac, not with any intention of uh, having him publish it. And then he one night said, I want to do your book, but I was drunk. <laughs> And didn't believe him, so the next morning I kind of had to sheepishly go up and say, are you serious? And he goes, yes, when's it going to be ready? Like, oh, so then I had to work. Now, in your case, because they're they're working on it, you know, every day when they get a chance, you're putting it aside for months mm -hmm. and coming back to it. Did you find you had trouble getting back into it? Like, did you have to reread it, remind yourself? Um Having been a tech writer, I have spreadsheets all over the place, so I have a timeline with everything that happens in every chapter. Okay. Um, I have character uh, profiles, um, chapter outlines, all kinds of stuff. So, yeah, getting back, I, I never really stopped working on it, except, like, I didn't write anything, but it was in my head. Right. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about it all the time, but mostly because part of it's a love story, and that was really fun. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, the, the hardest part is revising remembering stuff like people point things out this happened in chapter two. Oh, oh shit i'm working on chapter 29 yeah so that's that's the hard part right tony how about you I'm gonna name drop again like when i was in the horror world and i was going through reviewing and things there was an author that used to come on and he said it doesn't matter what you do every day write at least 500 words and i was brian king he used to come on continuously and say every single day right I was probably drunk. <laughs> <laughs> but he did. <laughs> but he did. It Drink and write 500 words. <laughs> and he would say, write during your lunch break, right before you get up, right when you're eating oatmeal. It doesn't matter, just write. Mm -hmm. And I took those words to heart, and I did I did do a lot of writing at lunch, at breaks, in the morning, or at night. It took me a year, but but I got it done. And it's, it's true, you know... Um, even full-time writers who also still have a day job for things like health insurance and 401k, it's a, it's a matter of finding, to, you know, Bev Vincent uh, gets up an hour earlier than he needs to before he leaves work, and that's that's his writing time. You know, Michael Lamo, uh, who doesn't write anymore, but when he was writing full-time, he would, he would take the train into New York City every day. He worked in the garment district, and he would write on the train. I don't know how you write on the train, yeah. uh, but he wrote, what, six or seven novels on the train, on the way in, and then on the way home. Um, it's just a matter of, of finding what works for you. I know in my own case, you know, my accident put me behind on everything. I owe people novels from the, 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 the deadlines were three years ago now. Um, and, you know, chronic pain has slowed me down. I type about 500 words and that's it. I'm done for 45 mm -hmm. minutes. And then I sit down and go give it a go again. But, you know, you make the time, you do it, you shove through it. So let's talk about edits and revisions. Um, Pre-readers. Did you all use pre-readers? Did you have a, a trusted person that you gave the manuscript to? You know, at, at what point, first of all, like how many drafts, and then at what point do you say, okay, this is, you know, talk about your revision process. Sherry, let's start with you again. I think beta readers and, and first readers are indispensable. Mm -hmm. I think you have to have somebody to, you know, because I think you're too invested in it, and it's it's your baby, and you don't want to find flaws with it, and I think you're afraid to find imperfections, but you need to have someone with an objective eye. Um, but, yeah, I absolutely use first readers, and I think you have to open yourself to their criticism. Um, they're not always valid, and I think that you, you know, you know your story best, but, you know, I wouldn't dismiss everything someone tells you about about uh, your novel. Um, but, yeah, I think I think first readers are indispensable, but, you know, you know your novel best, and, and you know, take the criticism and, you know, take what you need and leave what you don't. I had three better readers. One was one of my best friends from college, and the other one was my cousin, who I'm lucky enough that she's also a writer and a gifted editor. So she read the novel for, through for me and found a bunch of things that need to be changed, and so that was very crucial. Um, because I wrote this for an MFA program, mm -hmm. a lot of people touched it. Mm -hmm. um, it, which was good. Sometimes I had I was fortunate to have. To, um, to mentors in the program that I worked with. Um, the first mentor, 
I still don't think he understands what the book is about. <laughs> um, that's fine. That's fine. Um, but I, my second mentor was um, was Lucy Snyder, who is an amazing writer, nice. and mm-hmm. yep. she. We had an incredible brainstorming session during my like I think it was my my second term, and um, it really helped me push through some parts that I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but everyone has to critique each other's work. And so there were, um, each term I had about three or four people looking at the manuscript and, um, and yeah, sometimes Mm -hmm. it's great. Sometimes you get really good feedback and sometimes people say the craziest thing ever and you're like, they really don't have any clue what this book is about. I'm going to ignore that. Um, but yeah, you, you cannot do this alone. You really need Mm -hmm. people to take a look at your manuscripts. Yeah, I, um, I let out the first maybe four chapters for Borderlands, uh, so that got critiqued by you know, uh, Tom Monteleone, and who's really nice when he doesn't like something, and, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And then a, a few other people got to read a little bit, and then <clears throat> whenever my wife would come home after I'd been reading or writing, I would read her the chapter that I'd done. Uh, that lasted a while, um, and then I finished writing it and nobody else ever read it until McElveen read it. Read it. I just didn't want to be presumptuous and ask somebody to read something that big. So. I have a writer's group, a critique group, that I, I, I send things to. So the whole book did not get critiqued, and certain chapters did. But John and I talked about me submitting it to Havel House, so what I, I said is I'm going to... Uh, Send it to a, an editing house, somebody that I knew that did editing professionally, and I paid for it. I wanted Mac to get the best book he could, where he wouldn't have to spend a lot of time on it. So I spent the money, got it edited, got it back, gave it to Mac. Mac said, "Well, that's nice. I'm going to give it to my editor." <laughs> oh, I said, "Okay." He gave it to his editor, and it came back with so many change, or so many recommendations <laughs> and changes. Now, this has already been through a critique group mm-hmm. and another editor, and I got this, and I come really, he's back there, I know, so he's probably laughing. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he, they looked at it, and they, they recommended to get rid of all this stuff. And I said, no, no. And, and John finally said, look, this is your book, this is your vision, what do you want to do? And John and I literally wound up editing the last, you know, the last edit for it. Uh, so it was a real long process, and it started off, you know, with a group of people, and then it, you know, wound up with John and myself. But it was hard, and it went through a lot of edits. And John did a great job. Now, all of you have others in your life, uh, you know, be it a spouse or a partner or a child. The one thing I don't think there's a lot of advice out there on on the internet is is how to include the people in your life in this process because it, it is a long process and you're devoting time to it, you know, whenever you can. Um, did any of you encounter any problems? Did, was, did you was there any agreements you came to with the others in your life? You know, this this is what I, when the doors shut, <laughs> mom's writing. You know, um, mm-hmm. no, we can't go to the movies tonight. I have to stay home and do this. And this is a general question for you. If you don't want to answer, you don't have to. No, I'll go. Um, I have a now 17-year-old son, but he was actually one of the biggest guiding forces in me actually finishing the book because he would keep coming into the room or keep whenever we were out or whatever, he'd be like, Mom, so that book you're writing, when's it going to be done? <laughs> and that was, you know, I wrote it over the span of three years with most of it being that November, but there were times I'm like, yeah, you know, I should really start writing that again. And he, I think, he wanted to read it because of the fact that it has swears in it. And he was at the time a 14 year old boy, so of course he wanted to read it. But that was helpful in the fact that he was just always there being like, hey, mom, that book, you know, go work on it. And he's like, I have video games. I'll go play those. You go write. So it was so like a little Jim Moore. He really is. <laughs> he is. But he's now a tall Jim Moore. He's six, seven, so he's now a very wow. tall Jim Moore. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, yeah, um, I had trouble writing with anybody else around. So hmm. when I was laid off and Diane was working full time, that was great because I could write at home on my own. And 
when she was home, I had trouble doing it because it always, I always felt a little silly. Um, mm-hmm. Because, you know, I, again, pretty presumptuous thinking I could actually write something. So if she's in the house, it's like, mm, she knows what I'm doing. It's, it's almost worse than watching porn. <laughs> <laughs> Really? Yeah, I know. Well, no, actually. Uh, what did you write, John? <laughs> well, there's the nano book I wrote yeah. last year, which exactly. nobody will ever read. Um, oh, shit, I forgot where I was going. Oh, yeah. Um, so once Diane's retired, she's taken up uh, quilting. So now we get up in the morning, say hello, eat breakfast. She goes to her quilting room. I go to my office. And then we meet around 12 for lunch. And then four or five, one of us gets tired of doing whatever we're doing and we say are you done yet and well give me another hour and works out fine yeah she's got an annoying habit of being interested in everything i do <laughs> whatever hobby i have she wants to be involved in it. like, you know except for so that was my go ahead oh i was gonna say my wife as i mentioned before is a born again christian and i write a lot of bad stuff uh so we, we uh we, we don't see eye to eye on anything when it comes to my writing. And uh, one day, I wrote a sh- short story. It was never published, but it was a short story about the rapture. And uh, I left it on my desk because that's my desk, my writing desk. Well, I don't know why, but she decided to go to my desk, and she read the story. And I came home from work that night, and it was all marked up, telling me how I got it wrong, <laughs> what the Bible says, you know, what really <laughs> happened, What's going to happen? And I went berserk. I just blew up. And then I said, you never, ever do that to my work again. And I will never, ever say anything about you going to church again. And we came to an understanding. And she does whatever she wants to do with her religion. And she lets me do whatever I want to do with the writing. And we get along. Is, and if I'm getting too personal, just tell me. Because um, you know, I, when I interview people, I tend to forget there's people out there watching. Um, or listening. <laughs> Does that weigh on you, though? I mean, do you do you sit and wish, I wish she'd read one of my books and, you know. Oh, I do. I, I wish it in the worst way. Yeah. Uh, is not only for the writing, but for the social aspects. <laughs> if one of these writers calls up and says, hey, we're having a party or we want to go to a movie, I would love my wife to be able to come. <laughs> uh, but she's not comfortable most of the time. Right. Not only because she doesn't know him, but she thinks we're all going to hell. She really <laughs> believes that we're heathens. And she'll be really nice and she'll be you know, cordial and mm-hmm. she won't let anything show. But I know what she's thinking down, deep down inside. And that's why she doesn't go. That's why yeah. you don't see her at these no. events. Sure. Is, it the, is the reverse true? Like if you go to a church function with her, are you, are you sitting there thinking, oh man, all these people must... Yep. You know, think yep. I'm the one to help. I am. I, yeah. I am. They drive me crazy. No. They drive me crazy. So, let's talk about imposter syndrome. Oh. oh. Knows, but I, I don't know if I'm qualified to talk about imposter Are we even supposed to be on this panel? I feel like I should be here, man. I mean, look, I, I will share something with you. You know, I, I got published... I sold my first story in 95. I sold my first novel in 2003. Like I said, I've done 52 books since then. I still have imposter syndrome. Last month, I go out to dinner with Joe R. Lansdale and Chet Williamson. And the whole time, I'm thinking, why the hell did they let me come to dinner with them? (laughs) Um, Imposter syndrome never goes away. But for your first novel, it's it's like a stone on your back. So let's let's talk about your experience with that. Sherry, let's start with you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I think getting it published, you're like, okay, maybe this is some sort of validation. Maybe I'm not as shitty as I think I am. Um, but I, I think then when you start working on other stuff after that, it's like th- there is this fear. Was that a fluke? You know, uh, can I do it again? Is my next one going to be anything like the first one? Is it going to be better? Is it going to be worse? Uh, you know, you really start to doubt yourself. So, yeah, that's... I think, at least in my experience, yeah, it's it's a real thing, and it's you just have to believe in yourself. That's the only way around it is just to you know keep telling yourself that you know you're doing okay. The yeah, imposter syndrome is huge, mm-hmm. obviously, um, and I mean I've been paid for writing since I was 20, but I still 
every single time something's published in a magazine or newspaper, I'm like, okay, that's going to be the last time because they're going to realize that I'm a fraud and I shouldn't be writing this, but they still publish it. It's just, you know, that's just the way of the beast. And you throw in anxiety, which I know a lot of us deal with, and that doesn't help. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a real thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I I struggled because I felt like, first of all, um, I, people were telling me that my book was not a horror novel. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really struggled with that because I felt like I knew a lot about the genre and I had read a lot of books and I figured that um, it's a much wider genre than people like to give it credit for. Um, and I feel like a lot of people have tunnel vision when it comes to the horror genre. So when I wrote a novel about slavery, I couldn't think of anything more horrific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so I really struggled with that because people kept telling me that I was not a horror writer. And so my, my, that aspect of imposter syndrome is still kind of with me. It's fading a little bit because, um, the genre is opening up in a lot of ways and more people and different voices are being able to tell their stories. And, um, that's great, but I still struggle with that. And I keep asking myself, like, am I really a real uh-huh. horror writer? Michelle, <laughs> you are. Next time someone tells you invisible chains is not no. a horror novel, you tell them Brian Keene said they're an idiot. There you go. <laughs> That's validated. Yes, exactly. (laughs) On the cover above the fold. (laughs) Okay. Um, Yeah, well, again, having worked in high tech where no matter what you do, it's shit. Mm -hmm. Because there's always somebody (laughs) above you that knows better how to do the job you're doing than you do. Right. Even if they're, you know, anyway, never mind. So, yeah, uh, I kind of was terrified of anybody reading my stuff Mm because who the hell am I, as I said. And then somebody that actually writes reads my stuff and then gave it to Mac and and then Tony read it and it's like oh, Christ, dude, Tony he's like he's one of my idols he read Aww. it and he loved it it's like oh instantly <laughs> I'm a star you know and then I'm starting to get feedback from other writers that I've been reading for years and years and years and years um, and that was like oh shit maybe this is real <laughs> and then at Nikon uh, in July when the book well okay, and I was on a, a panel at, Stoke, at the Stokers in May and I, I, even being up there, like, well, why am I here? You know, I, I went to Borderlands. I've been on the same. The book came out at Nikon, and like, we sold out, and all these people are coming, and writers that I've been reading are buying my book, having me sign it, having me sign their books right. for them. And I was on a panel uh, at Nikon after that, and for the first time ever, standing in front of people, I was not afraid, because I had a reason to be up here. Mm-hmm. And I actually... <laughs> spoke up on the panel, and when it wasn't going where I wanted it to go, I could have took it back. So, <laughs> so I, yeah, I've gone from being an imposter to a total asshole. <laughs> <laughs> so you chose my career path. Yeah. I, I was not going to say that. But no, I, I um, yeah, I still kind of feel weird if anybody comes up and well, I'm not really a writer. No. Oh. I need that validation every day. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I feel it just like everyone else well, does. And it's got to be doubly tough on you because for years you're reviewing yeah. everybody. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, and you be, you became one of the go-to reviewers. Well, if, if I want a review that's going to be read by people, I'll send my book to Tony. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then you have a book. <laughs> Scare the shit out of me. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, one thing I never did while I was reviewing is give a bad review. We chose not to do that. So... If somebody had a bad review, I would bad book. I would call them or write them, and say, "Look, your book doesn't meet professional standards," and try to let it go at that. Right. So I didn't make overt enemies. You know, behind the scenes, people were angry because I, maybe I emailed them and said, no, "I can't review the book." But yeah, you're right. You worry that oh my god, after all that time, somebody just might take a chunk out of me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for the most part, they haven't. But Maybe the next one they will. Right. I don't know. So let's talk about that part. Reviews. You work on your baby. Your baby <laughs> comes out there into the world. How many of you are refreshing that Amazon page? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no comment. Oh. Have, have any of you gotten like a bad review? Bad customer review? Anything like that? No? Not yet. <laughs> no, but it's... 
you know, I'm like dreading the day. I know it's going to happen. I know the dreaded one star review is going to yeah. happen. It'll be for something stupid like, you know, this was I, I thought this was, was a video yeah. game or, you know, something. <laughs> I thought this was a drink. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I could see why someone would yeah. be confused. My, my favorite, if you go on the Amazon page for Dark Hollow, and I think it's the leisure mass market paperback edition, so you have to scroll back and back mm -hmm. and back, but... One star, and the review is, and I quote, he killed the dog. And the oh, dog, well, and the dog right. is spelled D A W G. He oh, killed not the dog. That's it. Mind. I printed that shit out, and I still to this day have a hand up. <laughs> um, I'm proud of that review. Did you put it on the back of a book? I sure. <laughs> Next book. That's going yeah. to the review. But do you, I mean, does that, like you said, we some of, you know most of us, I would say, suffer from some form of anxiety. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Do you find yourself dreading and just waiting? Oh yeah. If I see that there's a new review on Amazon, I'm like, do I read it? Do mm -hmm. I not? I've heard you know people say never read the reviews, or it's like never read the Facebook comments, never read the reviews. But I did, and to date, knock on whatever this is, uh, there to date they've been good. Mm -hmm. I haven't looked at Goodreads, and I because there's like two different versions of my book on there, so I don't get notified if there's reviews. Right. And I think there's good reviews on there, but I'm not sure. <laughs> Okay. One, one last question, and I'm going to open it up to y'all, so have your questions ready. Um, the publication process. Now, most of you ended up with, with one publisher. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, there you go. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Mary, and you, I chose, you yeah. chose to self-publish. For each of you, was it just Matt came up to you at a convention and said, "I want to publish your book"? No, uh, like, like what <laughs> was, your, what was your, <laughs> your process like? Did you look at different publishers and say, "Okay, I, I think my stuff might fit this wheelhouse," or did you decide all along, "No, I'm going to go the self-publishing route"? Or did did you? Did you all explore different options? I thought about going traditional publishing, but then I realized Father's Day was coming up and I really wanted to give the arc of the book to my father for Father's Day because he and my mom really inspired my love of reading. So I decided, I thought about it. I'm like, I don't really want to wait three years and have it, you know, go through the whole traditional publishing because they were getting old and I don't, you know, I wanted them to see it before they got too old. Um, so that's why I decided to go that route of just... It's self-publishing. Right. Mm -hmm. Sure, what about you? I mean, I've seen the kind of things that, uh, you know, John had been publishing for a few years. Um, and, you know, I, I basically just sat down and, you know, he's like, what are you working on? And I'm like, this is what I've got. And he was like, okay, that sounds like something that I might be interested in. And he was like, send me a synopsis. And I, as I said before, <laughs> I sent the synopsis and he asked me for the manuscript the next day. <laughs> Michelle. Um, so I pitched to Dark Regions Press, um, I don't know how many years ago, but I was at, at StokerCon and Michael Bailey was interested in it, but he's no longer with them. And so that went kind of by the wayside. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I pitched to Mac at, uh, StokerCon and, um, in like eight minutes, he decided <laughs> that he wanted to publish my book. Eight minutes. Wow. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's like so lightning. Long. It's like yeah. lightning. No, no. What you described to me was yeah. like if Neil Gaiman were to do a slave narrative, and it was so intriguing to me. Right. Yeah. Yeah, eight minutes. <laughs> there was a timer. Yeah, yeah that's what yeah. you get at the pitch session, eight minutes. And, and John, I mean, I mean, we heard your submission story. You got drunk. <laughs> but, well, I mean, before that, did you have publishers in mind? Were you I, thinking, or were you just thinking, I want to finish the book? Well, I'd had a couple of uh, uh, children's novels published way back, and the publisher was up in the Northwest Territories, and the second book <clears> came out late because the ice bridge didn't form, and they couldn't get the paper to the printer. <laughs> so that was a great experience. And I'd had some short stories rejected, but I'd, the book was big. I just kept, like, it was 225,000 words when it was finished. And people would just say, your first novelist, there's no way anybody's going to publish that. Mm -hmm. So I, I had no real vision of it being published. It was right. just, I'm going to finish this thing because I kind of like it and I'm having fun with it. And then I gave it to a bunch of people to read, not really expecting them to read it. I thought they were just being nice. And that guy actually read it. Mm -hmm. And 
asked for it. And it's like, holy shit, <laughs> maybe I can do this with other books. So I've, since, since he's done that, I have pitched books to a couple of other publishers. Um, nothing's come of it yet because I'm still learning how to be confident about pitching. Right. But yeah, it's, it was it's his fault. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, John did the introduction for uh, my first uh, short story collection, and uh, he really liked the stories, and when I told him I was working on a novel, he asked if he could see it. I didn't believe him for the longest time, and we kept I said, you really want to see this, you really want to see this, and he said, yeah, uh, and then he read it, and he said, yeah, I want this, and that's how it, how it happened. <laughs> I guess, John, my question for you would be, uh, are you going to publish Mary's next novel? <laughs> with a nice uniform. <laughs> um, well, all of them came up with something really off-beat, path be unique. And that's, that I think nowadays, not to be uh, copying what the common novel out there is. And that's, that's what so all of them are. That goes really in a different direction from a lot of what you read. All right, well, let's throw it open to the audience. Uh, throw up a hand. If I don't see a hand, I'll just call on you. Okay, yeah. <laughs> At Econ this year, the, the concept of being a pantser versus a plotter came into, into bold relief for me, and I've always been more of a pantser, and it occurred to me if I ever want to get anything done. I'm going to have to become more of a flyer. And, and did any of you have to change your approach to writing to get the, your first novel finished? Hmm. I wouldn't say so. I mean, no. I kind of have an idea where I'm going. So I, uh, I am a pantser, but I like to plot in my head. So mm -hmm. I, I at least know what direction I'm going. Um, not really, though. I, I at least like to have some idea. I had the entire idea formulated and plotted out with multiple, you know, family flow charts and a very bad drawing of a house of the interior layout, just so I knew where things were. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the ideas of the characters and who they were, and kind of the the main idea of where all the characters wound up. And then as I was writing, I wound up killing off a character I didn't plan to, but it just kind of felt better that way. <laughs> they deserve to die. <laughs> Uh, I'm mainly a pantser, um, but I would hit walls where I would have to plot because mm -hmm. I didn't know where the story was going at that point. Um, but putting it all together was really complicated. It was like putting together a quilt mm -hmm. after a point, and I don't recommend that for a first novel. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I wrote out uh, character studies. I, I made a map of the town because I'm a fanatic for, if I'm reading something and somebody turns left, they better be turning left and going in the right direction. Like, mm -hmm. You know, if they get somewhere, they better get there the right way instead of going somewhere else. Um, so, and then a, a vague plot, and then I just sat down and wrote it. And figured out, okay, well, I sort of had an idea where I was going, and then I got there. So, yeah. yeah, I had no idea where I was going from the first sentence to the end. It was completely pants. And as I was writing, the ideas would come to me, and I'd incorporate them. But the ending, I, the ending came to me at the end. I didn't have a, an idea beforehand. Building on his question, because you're all pantsers, and I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a pantser too. Um, I, maybe a pantser was sort of John's method. I might have a couple index cards of major plot points that I have to get to. But did any of you find? the final draft changed drastically from your original first draft? Like, my, my, my first draft of City of the Dead, everybody lived, and it was a happy ending. <laughs> For real. And, and by the end, of course, you know, Earth is, that's it. That's all, folks. Um, did, did any of you find that happening? Yes, actually. I, I had at least two characters that I eliminated from the entire novel, um, just because as, I'm, as I was you know, going through the editing process, they just didn't make any sense in, you know, in the flow of the story. Um, I felt like it was better just to axe them and move on um, and patch up as I went along to you know, ensure that they were completely eliminated. Um, 
Uh, so yeah. Uh, I, like I said, I had a character die that I didn't plan to at the beginning, and then I created an entire backstory and revealed it first character that I didn't plan to either. But other than that, it was kind of the it ended the way it was supposed to. I had like three different endings. Um, Did you publish all three of them? No, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, and but and the one of the endings I liked, I still like a lot. It doesn't belong at the end of this book, mm -hmm. but I'm going to use it somewhere Oops. else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, mine pretty much ended up the way I thought it would go. There were little bits and pieces, the characters that I thought were bad guys that aren't, or mm -hmm. somebody that I, I wrote just to kill because I had a great way to kill this person. <laughs> and I found out that somebody's it's somebody's favorite character. <laughs> so, you know, i got to think about that. Um, but the, what happened to me was as I was getting towards the end because I had an idea that it, this is what happens at the end, and then there's this sort of, thing that could happen afterwards, but that's what the reader's going to imagine. Uh, this one character did something, he's like, holy shit, that's book four. Well, that's book three. <laughs> but, so I got an idea for that, and then, well, there's another character, and that's book four. <laughs> so suddenly, I, yeah, it, it ended the way it was supposed to, but it spawned a couple of other things, mm -hmm. which was kind of fun. Yeah, mine, I didn't make any changes. So. No. <laughs> Who else? I saw a couple other hands in the back. Yes, I was wondering if anything was this gen this genre of uh, horror movies is usually not great by us, but uh, is there anyone thinking about maybe doing like a Christmas horror um, <coughs> um book or movie? Well, I I can't speak for the panelists. I've done two. Uh, <laughs> Both of them are available on DVD. Uh, check out I'm Dreaming of a White Doomsday. I'm the producer on that. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to plug. <laughs> that worked out well. Did you plant him? I, he, uh, he's my plant. Okay. I mean, Mac will be the plant for the rest of right. us. <laughs> he's our pet. Yeah. All you want to write a novel, your first novel, kill social media. Uh, mm. I, yep. What do you call it? A router for my internet is in my basement, and my writing room is three stories above. So I have a timer that kills the router at 10 o'clock, and I write till midnight. And I don't want to go all the way down. So <laughs> That's a good that idea. Just, you know, disruption for me. All right. That damn Facebook. Mm -hmm. and I don't yep. see how much you guys mm -hmm. This person is wrong. I have to tell <laughs> I uh, think I saw on Facebook a mention of the sequel. Oh Is yeah, it's trueish. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's true. No, I mean, no, it's yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> I I don't know how long it's gonna take me, but. Um, I'm trying to set a realistic goal of having it done by next year. In time for Nikon? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. That sounds like a good idea. There you go. Yeah, yeah there needs to be more storytelling. That's what people tell me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. How did you know the idea for your first novel was a novel, not just another short story? That's a good question. That is a good question. question. Can I, can I, am I allowed to talk? Go ahead. Yeah. Yes, please. My, my first one, The Rising was originally about a bunch of people trapped in a bomb shelter during the zombie apocalypse and they can't get out so they end up having to eat each other. Ooh. Just like the zombies live on the outside. Um, <laughs> which is nothing at all like The Rising. I, what happened is I was, my oldest son lived in New Jersey with his mother. I lived in Pennsylvania. And uh, I was driving, it was January, I'm on the turnpike, and there's this blizzard, and they shut the turnpike down, state of emergency, if we catch you driving, you'll be arrested. So sure enough, the National Guard catches me out there. And, you know, I mean, they're, they're loaded, you know. And uh, they're like, sir, you gotta get off the highway. And I'm like, all right, as soon as I get this exit up here, I will. And I watched, and when their headlights were gone, I kept going. <laughs> and I said, all right, well, men with guns won't stop me from seeing my kid. What would? Zombies? No. But that's what I should do with that novel. Scrap the entire first draft and started rewriting The Rising when I got home. Um, 
So that's where that came from. Yeah, I think I think I always knew uh, spirits was going to be a novel. Uh, I think that you know, I think alcoholism in general is you know such an involved thing and it's it's such a topic that can go in so many directions that I you know really wanted to explore you know kind of melding alcoholism and literal haunting uh, together and I thought it would be a really cool thing to like make as a big project so, yeah. yeah I don't know how to tell short stories because I talk long so yeah of course I write long <laughs> so it was never going to be a short story <laughs> Um, Invisible Chain started as a short story, and I wrote it, I don't know, maybe like 10 to 15 years ago. Um, it had a very, very different outcome, um, and uh, but I'm glad that I stuck with that idea. Those characters interested me enough to write an entire novel, so, yeah. Yeah, the novel started out just as a, well, not a short story, but it was a, a story that I didn't know how long it would be. It would be as long as it needed to be. <laughs> And yeah, I don't like writing short stories. They're really, really hard because I want to put in mm -hmm. tons of detail and mm -hmm. mm -hmm. things going on. And it's just short stories. Are, although the novel did spawn a short story based on the novel. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's up? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no. Uh, my uh, I, I joined. The, I signed up for this class called Write Better Fiction by the River City Writers, which is Chris Golden and uh, uh, Jim Moore. And when I signed up, I actually thought I was signing up for a short story class. And, <laughs> Surprise. And, yeah, and, and then I had lunch with, uh, it was either Chris or Jim. And they said, what do you, you got planned for your novel? And I went, what? And they go, what do you got planned for your novel? And I was totally taken by surprise. And I had, you know, I, I had to come up with something. And I've told the story over and over again. But after, it was with Jim, and I was... He said, well, what did you always want to write about? And I said, oh, that's easy, a haunted house. And he said, that's what your novel's going to be about. Mm -hmm. And it was. I went back, and that's why I wrote mm -hmm. Haunted House. You named it the one. I named that yeah. June. <laughs> what's, the, what's the word count for your novels, your first novels? 65 for the war house. 70. That's close to 60. Rest of you about yeah, it's like it was 70,000, yeah. Closer mm -hmm. to 90. 90, yeah. Mine's, uh, well, it was originally 220, and Mac asked Whoa. me to cut it in half. So <laughs> the first part's um, 95, I think. And the second part varies between 112 and 120. I'm working to get it down smaller. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, you talk about short story versus novel. There's also the, the novella, which mm -hmm. I will go to my death arguing is the perfect form mm -hmm. for a horror story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a lot of times I'll write, start what I think is a short story, and it ends. it's not quite a novel, so it ends up being a novella, mm -hmm. you know, 30,000 to yeah. 60,000. Mm -hmm. So Is right. Kill Whitey in the novel? No, Kill Whitey's uh, a good 70,000 words. Is it that long? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's probably 20,000 words I left on the cutting room floor. You're mm -hmm. kidding. Yeah. That read fast. It felt like a novella because it read fast. Well, I was trying to sell it to Hollywood, so... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do what I did. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Um, some of your books, like The Rising, they've had a hard time turning into film. So with the idea of your book becoming a film, you say it would be easier to write it as if it were to become one, like isolated, possibly or. You know, I don't. I can't speak for anyone else. I don't consciously set out to do that, but I grew up on comic books. And movies, mm -hmm. and, and I, don't get me wrong, I read as well, but I always, from an early age, I thought visually because I was thinking comic book style storytelling, and uh, a lot of my work, I think, just shows that influence. It, it's written to be very visual, and they keep telling me that you know that's easily adaptable, and yet you know then they don't want to adapt. Oh, we can't film this, you know, it's too expensive. I, I, I. You know, The Rising has been optioned. That book's now 20 years old. It's been optioned, uh, well, not quite 20 years. 20, 2003, 20, someone do math for me. Which <laughs> one, right? like, 16 years old. It's probably been optioned 17 times in those 16 years, and every time it's, no, but this is too expensive. You know, they, they've had, they had uh, Robert Downey Jr. interested in playing Jim at one point. They couldn't get it made. He went on to do Iron you know, they, they've had Gary Sinise, they, all these people attached. 
Um, and it never gets made, and it always comes down to, it was too expensive for a zombie movie. So, but you, as a writer, as a novelist, you can't think about that. The, the end game should never be, I want to sell this to Hollywood and have health insurance again. No. <laughs> you know, your, your, your end game is just, I want, to, I want to write this novel and put it out there in the world and communicate something or, or bring somebody some, some joy or some entertainment. You, know? you, you can't think about all that. It, that stuff's nice when it happens, but you can't think about that every time. Anyone else? What was that? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the clap. How do you, how do you pick character names? How do you pick character names? Oh, oh gosh. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, uh, people I know. Um, mm -hmm. It's funny. Uh, I named Tori in my novel after my best friend. Um, and I called her and I said, hey, my book is, is getting published and I named my protagonist after you and she's a drunken train wreck. And she was like, thanks. <laughs> For me, I kind of just went back through popular names from the years that people would have been born and just kind of glanced down and saw. And I found at one point that I was naming all the guys all had four-letter word names, so I had to change that. So I changed the word Nick, the name Nick to Spencer throughout, but I forgot about the then I did a find all and replace and found out, yeah, it didn't go well because then I was reading through and I'm like, why is he suspensering someone? <laughs> oh, he was supposed to be snickering at someone. Okay, that's because I did. I'm like, I learned a lesson that day, yeah. I, I did. I had that. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I've had that happen. Uh, so my antagonist is, he has the name of a person I met when I was a teenager who was a predator. Oh. <laughs> wow. Yeah. We're getting waved at because I'm a terrible moderator. I didn't realize it was 120. <laughs> all right. The most important thing to take away from this, all of them have books for sale. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, and we're back. That is it for this week. Next week, by popular demand. The staff of Tor's new Nightfire mass market horror imprint. We're going to ask them all the questions, all the questions, all the questions, everything you wanted to know. As both a reader and a writer, we're going to ask them. Uh, Kelly, enjoy your week off writing. Matt, enjoy your week off on vacation. I will, and we will see you here next week, folks. Bye. Bye. Bye.